In this video, we're going to continue looking at solutions of the heat conduction equation. And in particular, we're going to focus on one-dimensional conduction with generation. One-dimensional steady conduction with generation. As normal, we'll look at the problem definition. We'll solve the problem, and all the while we'll look at some examples to help develop a physical understanding of one-dimensional heat transfer with generation. So starting with our heat conduction equation and Cartesian coordinates, we'll go through our assumptions. First assumption is that the problem is steady, so there is no changes with time, which eliminates our term over here, the <coughs> energy storage term. And we're going to say there's constant internal generation by assumption 2, and so we'll leave our Q dot there because we have constant uh, energy generation. And we're going to say it's one-dimensional, and so with one-dimensional, of course, variations in Y and Z, we can set to zero by assumption 3. And we're left with the conduction term in the X direction uh, plus the Q dot, the uh, constant internal generation being equal to zero. Since it's one dimensional, we can turn our partial derivatives into ordinary derivatives. And finally, we'll use assumption four in order to extract the thermal conductivity from inside the derivative operator, and then we can divide through. So our final starting point is a second order partial differential equation, the second root of temperature with respect to x, uh, plus the volumetric generation divided by the thermal conductivity that we took out of our E in minus E out term, term is equal to zero. We're going to look at this like the figure on the left here, where we have a Dirichlet condition, a known temperature at the boundary at the minus L side, and a known temperature at the uh, L side. So our system is such that x equals zero occurs in the center of our system, and we have a distance L of material in the positive x direction and a distance minus L in the minus x direction. So x equals zero is the symmetry line or the center of our material. And we're going to look at these constant temperatures on each side. The thermal conductivity of the material is constant, and of course the volumetric generation is constant. With our boundary conditions, sorry, before we get to our boundary conditions, uh, we can now integrate our partial differential equation. Integrating once, uh, we get minus q dot over k times x plus c1. Integrating it again, uh, we get a quadratic in x for the temperature distribution and two unknown constants that we'll solve from each of our two boundary conditions. So we can write those two boundary conditions. At the minus L surface, the temperature is equal to T1. At the positive L surface, the temperature is equal to T2. And of course, we can evaluate the temperature at both locations with those boundary conditions, giving us two equations. And from each of these two equations, we can solve for the two unknown constants. Writing that out, the temperature at minus L being T1, the temperature at L being T2. Of course, if we subtract these two relations, we'll eliminate C2, and we can solve for C1. And then we can substitute C1 back into either of these in order to evaluate C2. Put that together, substitute it into our general solution, and we get uh, the temperature profile through our system with one-dimensional conduction through a system with constant conductivity uh, for a constant thermal generation. And interestingly, we get a quadratic variation in x for the temperature. So we'll look at that in more detail. Of course, now that we have our temperature distribution, it's very, very easy to write a function in Python so that we can use it to begin to explore it. And I'll show you the function that I use, uh, where I write a function which I've called T generation. And it takes the temperature 1 and temperature 2 boundary conditions, the half length of our thing of our material L, the thermal constant thermal conductivity and the Q dot, and I have a default number of 40 points. My function will generate the X over which to plot the solution and, of course, directly solves this equation and returns both the x's to plot on and the temperature distribution. Once we have our temperature distribution, we can calculate the heat flux anywhere in there simply by applying Fourier's law. The heat flux at any x location is simply the, conduct, the negative of the conductivity times the temperature gradient, and so if we evaluate the temperature gradient, we will know our heat flux at any location. Very easy to take that derivative and to simplify, and here is an expression now for the heat flux at any location with respect to x. And of course, the temperature profile varies as a quadratic, 
And so when I take the derivative, the heat flux is going to vary linearly with x. So let's start by looking at a symmetric example. I'm going to take the temperature on side 1 to be the same as side 2 at 0 0.5. I'll say that my length is 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters. We'll use a, a 1 for the uh, thermal conductivity. And we'll start with looking at a Q dot of 5 watts per meter cubed. Here's my temperature profile. I've superimposed it here, what it looks like. I have a positive energy generation within the material. And here's that temperature distribution blown up and with the numbers on it. I can see a number of features right away when I look at this. The first of all is that my temperature gradient is zero right in the center of my object. Temperature gradient is zero right on the center. This will, <coughs> this is not surprising. Because I have a symmetric solution, T1 and T2 are the same value, this becomes an axis of symmetry, and this part of the solution is perfectly symmetric to this part. And if this is going to be our mirror image, of course, the slope has to be zero here. And if the slope is zero or the temperature gradient is zero, of course, the heat flux at this location also has to be zero. The heat flux can now easily be determined at each of these locations. I can look at the slope or the temperature gradient at this surface, and I see that I have a positive uh, I can look at the temperature gradient on this side, and I see that I have a negative temperature gradient. Of course, when I multiply that by the negative of the conductivity, I'll see that I have a heat flux going out this surface here. And here I have a positive temperature gradient, which means I have a heat flux going out here. And of course, in this case, because it's symmetric, these are these two temperature, these two heat rates or heat fluxes are going to be equal. And because I have a positive thermal generation, of course, all of that energy that is generated inside here has to leave through these boundaries. And so conservation of energy is going to tell me that the sum of these is equal to the total amount that's generated inside. And we'll see that in more detail in a second. But first, let's look at more details about the temperature gradient. We've seen the equation when we take the derivative of the temperature and multiply by minus k, Fourier's law. We get an expression which is linear for the heat flux. And that heat flux goes from a negative 1, so as I had sketched previously, we have a heat flux going out at minus 1 uh, watts per meter squared at the minus L surface, and we have a positive 1 going out at the L surface. They are equal and opposite in direction, as we expect, and of course the heat flux goes through 0. The heat flux goes through 0 at the center. So we can superimpose that on our diagram. And we can see the heat flux now here passing through zero at the center of the temperature distribution and our heat flux is leaving at the L and minus L surface. Again, if I put these two graphs together, the temperature profile is a quadratic. The heat flux is related to the gradient or the derivative of the temperature, so it's linear. And where the slope of the temperature profile is zero, of course, my heat flux has to be zero. Also, we can calculate the location where the heat flux is equal to zero. Simply by taking my expression for the heat flux and setting it equal to zero, I can now solve for that location, x0, where the heat flux is equal to zero. In my symmetric case, where t1 is equal to t2, of course, t2 minus t1 is going to be zero, and so that x is going to be zero. We'll see this again as we move through with different boundary conditions. I could plot this in different ways. It's a one-dimensional problem, but let's get used to looking at this for later when we're looking at two-dimensional situations. I could draw contour lines to represent the temperature. Now you can see here, looking at the temperature profile, that if I move a distance 0.1, minus 0.1 in the x direction, my temperature changes this amount. I have to move quite far to get a 0.2 degree difference in temperature. If I move, if I look at a 0.2 degree temperature difference over here, I've only moved a tiny amount in x. And so these lines of constant temperature, the contour lines, are far apart in the middle of the part where the temperature gradient is very low, and they get closer and closer together where the temperature profile gets steeper and steeper. And so you can read right away from a contour plot that we have a much lower heat flux here than we have here. We can also see again, because the temperature is higher, the lighter color being a hotter temperature, that high to low temperature is moving in this direction, high to low temperature is moving in this direction. The plot looks much better if we use colors instead of just lines. It starts to look like some real work. 
And we can put a nice temperature scale to show this, but all of the same features are here in this graph. And finally, we could even superimpose with that the heat flux vectors. We know the heat flux everywhere. We can calculate the value of this. We know that the heat flux in the y direction is zero, so I can make a vector which is in the x direction, which has an x component of this value here at every location and a y component of zero. And I can make an arrow whose magnitude represents the heat flux at that point and whose direction points in the direction of heat transfer. So of course it's zero at the center. And these tiny vectors are getting bigger and bigger until we have a very noticeable vector there. Okay, so now this is a summary of the symmetric examples. What I've done in the central figure is I have changed the generation rate from 2 up to 10 watts per meter cubed. Of course, as we generate energy within there with a positive volumetric generation, we're seeing that the maximum temperature is getting larger and larger. The temperature gradient, or the heat flux going out, is getting steeper and steeper as I go to higher generations. Because, of course, as more energy gener is generated inside, we have to have a higher heat flux out to balance to conserve energy. If I use a negative value for the heat flux represented by the dashed lines here, then of course my heat flux vectors are going in the opposite direction. You can clearly see it. The slope is this way and the slope is this way. And so my heat flux vectors for when the case when we have energy being consumed or a negative generation is in the opposite direction here. And the corresponding heat fluxes are shown below here. That heat flux is getting larger and larger. The green with the highest volumetric generation has the largest flux going out. Again, it must in order to conserve energy. Let's look at that energy balance. I've talked about it in this video, but let's look at it. Of course, our starting point for conservation of energy is that energy which is stored in the volume is equal to the difference between what goes in and out plus the energy which is generated. That's the equation that we started with to derive the heat conduction equation. And our storage term was zero because we were using a steady system. And we have no energy. Uh, I'm going to say we have no energy coming in when I look at this because I can look at the solution and see that I only have energy going out on both sides of this one. And so I have an E out term. And of course I have energy generation because that's the problem that we're solving. So the E out has to be equal to the E generation or the E dot out has to be equal to E dot generated. And I can calculate E out. It is the conduction at those boundaries. So the Q dot, the given by Fourier's law, multiplied by the cross-sectional area, which is going out here. Now this is in the negative direction, but I know it's going out. I can see from the directions, and I've chosen it to be the E out. And so in order to sum up the total amount of energy, I need to take the absolute value of that one, which I know is negative, and plus energy, which is going out here. It's an out term, but it happens to be positive, so I don't need the absolute uh, the absolute value signs because I know it's positive. And likewise, I can calculate the generation. The Q dot represents the watts per meter cubed that is being generated in there. So if I multiply Q dot times the volume, I'll get the total energy in watts, which is generated inside the volume. And that volume is the cross-sectional area of the material times the dimension in this direction, which is 2L. So if I look at this, Evaluating this equation, I see that the total heat flux out of the wall is 2 watts per meter squared, cancelling out the cross-sectional area, which appears in every term. Total heat flux out is 2 watts per meter squared, and the total energy generated uh, per unit cross-sectional area is also 2 watts. So we can see that energy is conserved in this example, as it must be. Now we're going to move on to examples where the temperature is not equal. And so in this example, I have temperature 1, which is at point 8, and I have temperature 2, which is at point 4. I have the same dimensions and the same thermal conductivity, and I'm going to start with a case where I have a Q dot of 2 watts per meter cubed. It's a positive energy generation, so now, again, I can draw my slope to represent the heat transfer crossing the boundary, and in both cases, I have a negative slope. I'm going to multiply that by minus k in Fourier's law, and so that's going to show me that there is energy coming in at the minus L surface and heat being transported out in the positive x direction at the L surface, and that the heat being transported out is greater, this slope is greater than this slope. So the heat transported out is larger, this vector is a larger size, and the difference between these two, of course, is going to be balanced by the amount of energy that's being generated inside this volume by the volumetric generation term.
here's my heat flux plotted here. I have a zero reference line plotted here, and we see, yes, we have a positive value here and a larger positive value here. And, of course, we can quantify these numbers and see what they are at minus, minus L, it's 0.6 watts per meter cubed, and at the x equals L boundary, it's 1.4 in this example. As I increase the volumetric generation going up to 6 watts per meter cubed, now we see that we're getting a change in this profile, that the difference between the straight line uh, between T1 and D2 is getting larger, and we now have a zero in the heat flux. And of course, we had our equation uh, to solve for that, to solve for where that x0 location was, and that x0 is at minus 0.17, and we see that the slope here is zero, and of course, the corresponding heat flux here is crossing the zero. That also means that now we have a positive slope at the minus L surface, and the heat is leaving that surface in the minus x direction. We have a negative slope at this surface, and the heat is leaving in this direction at this surface. Again, of course, the difference between these two going out at each surface will be balanced by the amount that is generated in there. And we can quantify the exact um, heat fluxes at each of those surfaces as well. As we go to an even larger volumetric generation, that point of zero heat flux or zero slope on the temperature distribution, zero temperature gradient, moves closer towards the center line, and we get larger heat fluxes going out of each of these surfaces. If we go to a negative generation, it looks very much like the positive generation, except, of course, the temperature is below the value that it would be if we didn't have any generation or the straight line value there. We can do all of the same calculations. And summarizing all of the cases where we have a positive 2, 6, and 10 watts per meter cube being generated, as well as a negative minus 2, minus 6, and minus 10 watts per meter cubed, and we see that these are, in fact, uh, there is a plane of symmetry between these. When we have a positive generation, of course, the heat needs to leave the system in the amount that's generated. When we have a consumption or a negative generation, heat has to enter the system to balance that, and you can see the corresponding flux. And we'll use this with some more examples in the subsequent videos.